Hi, it's your pal Steamed Hams. Join me every week on the Unforgettable Luncheon as we discuss topics in the nerd world like gaming, comics, cartoons, and whatever else may cross my mind. You can find me on the socials as SteamedHams81 on Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram, and YouTube. You can also find me as the Unforgettable Luncheon on Facebook. And check out Steamed Hams Merchatorium, the link to which will be in the description of this podcast. The Unforgettable Luncheon, nerd comedy at its okayest. The X-Men. Was there a more popular comic franchise in the 90s and early 2000s? Probably. But back then, they were everywhere. Comics, cartoons, toys, and of course, video games. What if I told you those games were a mixed bag? Some good, some bad, and some published by LJN. So let's fire up Cerebro and talk about some of the games based on the X-Men today on the Unforgettable Luncheon. Hi, it's your pal Steamed Hams. I hope you're ready for an unforgettable luncheon. The X-Men was a comic book superhero team created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby in 1963. They were mutants, the next step in human evolution, born with powers that manifested during puberty. This particular group was recruited by Professor Charles Xavier, or Professor X, going with the theme and trained to become the X-Men, a team to defend humanity against evil mutants and other villains attempting to take over the world. Same thing they do every night, Pinky. Now, they did start in comics, but they branched out in other forms of media and merchandise, such as toys, cartoons, the most famous one being, of course, the 1992 X-Men animated series. Movies, of which they really just... They went with screwing around with that timeline. And, of course, video games. Why do you think we're here? Some of these games were good, like the arcade game. Some were not so good, mostly because they were published by LJN. For those of you who don't know, maybe a little young, you didn't grow up in the Nintendo era, LJN was a toy and video game company who did a lot of games based on licensed properties, like X-Men, Back to the Future, Jaws, who Framed Roger Rabbit. Now, I owned exactly one of those, and that was Who Framed Roger Rabbit, because when I was a kid, that was one of my favorite movies. But the game, a little complicated for a kid, to be honest. You know, I played the other ones, you know, and LJN had this notorious problem for the games that they weren't high quality, and they were difficult as fuck. You know? So, hence the reputation. LJN sucks when it comes to games. But, that's a story for another episode. Today, we're going to talk about a few of the X-Men games from the classic era. Usually the 80s and 90s. Buckle in, kids. We're going to start with the Uncanny X-Men, released in 1989 by LJN. This one was not good. It features Wolverine, Cyclops, Colossus, Nightcrawler, Storm, and Iceman. And they all had their own abilities, limitations, that sort of thing. Like Colossus, Wolverine, Nightcrawler. They all did melee, so you had to get up close and punch. Whereas Storm, Iceman, and Cyclops all had a ranged attack of some sort. And they has again, they had their own abilities and limitations. Like, Colossus couldn't jump like everybody else could. What the fuck? Why would you make the guy not be able to jump? What the hell? And Storm, if you held down a button, she flew. Yeah. Now, you always had two characters on the screen. So, if you played two-player, you had your two characters. But, if you chose one-player mode, you got an AI partner to help you out. But, unfortunately, AI was not exactly that smart, so you were stuck with a doozy. Yeah, so how it went was you fought through the level, you you defeated bad guys and all this and that and the other thing. You got to a boss. You 
hopefully beat the boss. And then you have to fight your way all the way back to the beginning of the level because a bomb was planted and you don't want to get blown up. Now, here's the best part of all this nonsense. Okay. The final level was accessed by putting in a damn code at the title screen. Here's the kicker. The code was hidden on the label of the game and only partially. The rest of it was supposed to be found within the game, but oops, they never did that. So, but you can also only access this level after you've beaten all the other five levels. Then you can go fight Magneto, who is the X-Men's villain du jour. I think I rented this game like all of once and never again. It was terrible. I'm like, oh, X-Men, this is so great. And I'm like, this game sucks. What the hell? No. No. Still makes me shake my head and shudder to this day. And next, we're going to get into a good X-Men game to kind of cleanse the palate here. We're going to talk about X-Men the Arcade Game, released in 1982 by Konami. Now, Konami, that's a, that's a company you could set your watch to. They made good games. This was a side-scrolling beat-em-up based on the animated Pride of the X-Men cartoon pilot, which, for those of you who don't know, was actually a pilot for a proposed X-Men series, featuring the character of Kitty Pride, you know, otherwise known as Shadowcat. She arrives at the mansion, and, you know, she meets the X-Men, and of course, hijinks ensue because of Magneto and the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants, and, you know, things happen. And this is more or less based on it because it has all the characters from that specific um, cartoon. So you got to play as either Cyclops, Wolverine, Colossus, Storm, or Dazzler. Yes, Dazzler, a character created in the 70s to be a disco queen proto-Jubilee. Because, yes, she pretty much has the same powers of, as Jubilee, except she turns sound into light. Which, I know I'm, I'm supposed to be doing suspension of disbelief, but how the hell does sound become light? Eh, whatever, it's a comic book. She somehow, as soon as Disco died became like some sort of jazzer size type model. Now she's wearing a leotard and a, and a leather jacket. And she's got the headband and she's probably and step and turn and step and turn and leg kick and leg kick and shoot them beams. You know, uh, so you battle through like seven levels to defeat Magneto and rescue Professor X and Kitty Pride uh, because, well, Magneto decided to kidnap him. It's a pretty standard beat em up where you punch the crap out of like human sized sentinels. So you didn't have like the big giant sentinels you normally have. These are ones that are standing eye to eye with the X Men and just getting the living crap kicked out of them. All right. You got to use powers for each character that drained like a small orb depending on how many lives you had. So you get a new life, you get two new orbs. After that, it drains your life. So once you get past a certain amount of life, forget using your mutant power, you're just back to giving them the old knuckle sandwiches. Now, in the Japanese version, you actually had health and mutant power pickups, so you could replenish this stuff. But the U.S. version? Of course not. You're on your own, pal. Keep pumping them quarters in if you want to finish the game. You know, but the best part of this game was the voiceover dialogue. Oh, my God. This almost gives House of the Dead 2 a run for the money. House of the Dead 2 had some terrible voice acting, but this had shit that... I swear, I swear, there were lines written by Tor Johnson. If you don't know who Tor Johnson is, look him up. I'm not explaining this shit. My favorite line is where Magneto says, X-Men, welcome to die. Which made me think of the Tor Johnson joke because now it's time for go to bed. Again, look it up. Okay, and it was just the the dialogue was just cheesy as hell, and but then again, it was made in ninety two, and it was like one of the first games where they had like you know, hey, voiceover, so it's gonna they're gonna have not a whole lot of budget for it, so they're just gonna take what they can get, you know. Now the game came in two versions: a four player and a 
fucking huge six player, which is like the only version I've honestly ever seen him played. Okay, this thing is like hoking. Okay, and believe it or not, it is big enough to where you have space between the players. You're not all mashed together like you are in some of these multiplayer games, which is pretty cool. You know, my favorite was always to play Colossus because especially not only was he positioned, just, you know, right there kind of in the middle so I can get a good full bank of the screen there. But for some reason, I always thought a dude who could turn into metal was fucking cool. So became a favorite. Now, as I said, this game is like an absolute quarter gobbler. And even when you finish the game, it just restarts. So, I mean, free game until you die. So, hmm. But the game was so satisfying when you finished it because you worked so hard. Because they don't just like, go, oh, one or two enemies on the screen. Oh, no. They're all coming at you in droves, okay? They're coming at you like you're holding Taylor Swift tickets. They'd probably want to beat the shit out of you and just be like, burn the tickets. But, you know. You know. I actually had this on my Xbox 360, and I think I still do. It's got the American and Japanese ROMs, so I've played both. And I like being able to have health pickups, you dicks. Now, you can find this in the six-player version. Where else but the Galloping Ghost Arcade in Brookfield, Illinois. Okay? And, of course, yes, I have played the game. And it's fun. I've been playing it since it came out. And I always play it because it's fun. Now, we're going to go on to the Super Nintendo and Genesis era. So, early mid-90s. Now, I know this is not fully an X-Men game because it's a crossover between Spider-Man and the X-Men. But 1992's Spider-Man and the X-Men in Arcade's Revenge follows a team up between Spider-Man and the X-Men. This team of course, composed of Cyclops, Wolverine, Storm, and Gambit, who at the time was a newer character that was gaining popularity. Also one of my favorites from the uh, animated series. So, there you go. Spidey witnesses Gambit being kidnapped and follows him to Arcade's lair. Arcade was an X-Men villain who was kind of like Willy Wonka if he actually let the kids be killed. Ooh, yeah, hmm, yeah. Uh, basically, his whole thing is an amusement park that's designed to kill his victims. He's more or less an assassin. He's also Willy Wonka with far less OSHA compliance. You know, but guess who was next? Of course, the X-Men. And they're all thrust into various, um, in the various little worlds or levels or whatever you want to call them. And they have to battle their way out. Now, every hero except for Spider-Man gets two levels. Spidey does like this initial one where he's shutting off alarms to get in. After that, he has two separate levels himself. Um, and those second levels were generally hard. I mean, a couple of first levels were goddamn near impossible. You know, like Gambit. He was just being followed by a big spiked ball that just didn't stop. And you had all the obstacles and jumps in the world. I have never finished Gambit's first level to this day. Storm. Don't get me started on Storm. She was a goddamn underwater level. So you had to you had to not only contend with your own life bar, but you had to find air pockets to air up. And you had to like make the water rise to get out of this level. And I think I've only finished I finished her first level and eh, not too bad. Took a lot of practice, but um, then you have, like, Spidey. He's going through construction sites, and he's fighting, if I remember right, Shocker, and I forget who else, because it's been a long goddamn time. Wolverine is, like, kind of like a funhouse, ball pit, circus type thing, where he's fighting, like, toys and clowns and jack-in-the-boxes and whatnot. His second level is he's being chased by Juggernaut, and you have to drop shit on Juggernaut's head to eventually break his helmet, and then you can attack him. If you try to attack him head on, you're just going to run over. And yeah, I never finished that one to this day. Now Cyclops, his is a bit of an oddball one. He's in a mine. Okay. And his optic blasts actually drain your life. But you can pick up these like red ruby quartz crystals to regain your life. And 
you're fighting against sentinels and a a futuristic cyborg assassin named Nimrod. I haven't seen Nimrod in an X-Men book in ages. Yeah, he must have died out in the 90s. Um, And then, of course, the second level of his is a damn minecart level. So it's basically like, you know, Donkey Kong Country. Except I think this came out before Donkey Kong Country. So there you go. It was fun, but it was very frustrating when you got to those second levels because they were rough. Okay, I still haven't finished this game, but I guarantee you if I got my hands on it, you bet I would sit and play it regardless of how many times I got my ass kicked. And in 1993, X-Men was also released for the Sega Genesis, but not as Arcade's Revenge. This was a separate story. I actually remember playing this a lot at my cousin's house, and as is the style, you know, the style at the time with X-Men games, it was hard. I mean, has there been an easy X-Men game? (laughs) No. In this game, the Danger Room, the X-Men's training simulator room, is infected with a virus that removes all of its safety protocols. So somewhere, somehow, some way, an OSHA manual is exploding. Wolverine, Cyclops, Gambit, and Nightcrawler must survive the Danger Room's deadly simulations until, of course, the virus can be isolated and defeated. And, of course, who planted the virus? Hey, our old pal Magneto, the go-to villain for X-Men games in the 80s and 90s. Now, you could switch off on characters, and you had um, a meter that basically fed your mutant power, per se. Okay, like your mutant power, because you still had your standard punch, kicks, jumps, stuff like that. But you use this mutant power, this this meter will drain, but it will slowly regenerate. But you can switch characters during the level. So if you switch to somebody who's got a, who had a full tank, they got a full tank. Your other guy is pretty much his stuff's regenerating while he's sitting on the sidelines. Now, the thing about this game, again, it was difficult as hell. Also, to defeat one particular boss, Mojo, you know, he was from like that Mojo world or whatever, which I never got too much into that. Get this. You had to reset the game. I shit you not. I am not making this up. You're fighting him. You got to lightly press the reset button and it defeats him. How are we going to figure that out back then? Wasn't in the manual. They didn't leave us clues. Okay, we didn't have the interwebs back then to look up game FAQs and look up YouTube and be like, how the hell do I beat this guy? Holy shit, I pushed the reset button. How'd you figure that? out? I accidentally reset my game and it, it took me right to the end of the level. That is weird. Okay. Another one I never finished. Of course, I wasn't a Genesis kid. I was a Super Nintendo kid. So, I probably never will finish this game. So, there. Now, there were so many other X-Men games, um, both with the teams and a good portion of them, Wolverine-focused. Like, a 19, I believe it was 80s or early 90s Wolverine game. That was uh, decent, but what sucked was when you used his claws, it knocked down your life bar. I'm like, then what's the point? You know, there was another one that I actually owned called Adamantium Rage, which when you had the claws retracted, yeah, I healed. That game was tough. I ain't gonna lie. That one was fucking hard. I don't think I got past like the second or third level on that one. You know, there was even a half-ass tie-in to the third X-Men film, X-Men The Last Stand, and it kind of lazily explains why Nightcrawler isn't in the movie. You know, and it's like, People might ask that question and say, wait, he was a member of the team at the end of the second one. Where is he now? And they don't explain the movie. So if you wanted to know, you had to go buy this game and finish it. It tells you at the end. Nightcrawler's like, ah, I'm going to go, ah, go bye-bye. You know, and he just leaves. You know, if we went through all these games today, we'd be here for fucking ever. So maybe another time. You know? We'll hit those X-Men games. Now, the X-Men is a stellar franchise. It's been going on since the 60s. It kind of died down a little bit in the 70s, 80s. 
picked up heavily in the 90s. That was when I became a fan. Um, and it's still going strong. I mean, with like multiple TV shows, movies that are increasingly more and more confusing, that sort of thing. It's going to keep going forever. I swear to God, it will keep going forever. My great grandkids, if I ever have kids, will be like, hey, these are the things my great grandfather was reading when he was a child. But they're theoretical great grandchildren because I have no kids. So, ha. Well, that's it for another unforgettable luncheon. I hope a good time was had by all. You can find me online on Twitter, also known as X, Twitch. Instagram, YouTube, and now TikTok as Steamed Hams 81, and as the Unforgettable Luncheon on Facebook. Come check it out. Like my page. Wait for new uh, new updates. You know, reach out to me. Tell me what you like, what you don't like. You know? You know, whatever you want. And don't forget to check out my merch store, Steamed Hams Merchatorium. Of course, the links to all of these are in the description of this episode. Also, with the merch store, if you are a Twitch subscriber, as in you pay that five clam, four or five clams a month to subscribe and skip commercials on my channel when I live stream, you get a discount at the merch store. So, check it out, folks. All right. So, I'm your host, Steamed Hams. Join me next time when the topic will be something nerdy.